Well, thank you, Simon, for asking me to do this, and thank you all for joining me. Um, I'm aiming to make this about an hour and a quarter long with a chance for questions at the end. So I'll just get the slideshow up and running. And here's what we've got in store for tonight. <coughs> it's fairly self-explanatory and uh, we'll come to it as we go, but we'll be talking about the um, marks, the, the TOC H hostels um, that were set up after the war. Okay, let's get started. So when the war ended, Tubby had a dream. His dream was to recreate the Fellowship of Talbot House in peacetime. Tonight, I plan to tell you how that dream unfolded. We'll look at the buildings um, that became the new Talbot Houses and how they came about. We'll talk about the people that lived in them, the marksmen. Um, we'll look at the work that was carried out in them. We'll also talk about how the focus of Tok H soon changed, although without these houses, things would never have got started in the first place. Uh, these were the houses that Love built. As we go through this talk, you'll hear me using words like houses and hostels um, to describe the buildings. This can get a bit confusing because Tokage also opened some additional hostels, which weren't marks. They, um, these get mentioned tonight, but our focus is on the, on the true marks. The houses number one to 24 uh, that were established during the golden years of 1920 to 1931. Um, they were born as copies of Talbot House, hence the in army style, they were named Talbot House Mark One, Talbot House Mark Two, and so on. Uh, and I know that you can't tell, but I'm talking in Roman numerals whenever I mention the numbers of the housing. So we'll see how marks were central to Tokage's early work. Um, but even by 1923, it was apparent that branches were much easier to start. And so the focus of Tokage was, was really put there. The importance of marks slowly diminished over the, over the ensuing years. And by the late 60s and 70s, they became both unfashionable and a, a drain on resources. Right, so I've laid the foundations. Let's start building up the brickwork. The Tubby wanted to open a new building, uh, a new Talbot house in London. And in April 1919, writing in The Messenger, which was the newsletter of St. Martin's in the Fields, the church of his good friend and Dick Shepherd, Tubby outlined his plans. Um, and he thought Trafalgar Square would make a good place to start. Let me read his opening words. Depose Nelson, remove the column, ungum the lions, deduct the fountains, wash out the National Gallery, and cease to visualise Whitehall. Then roll the surface flat apart from the execrable path, and with these trifling alterations, Trafalgar Square becomes the grand place of Poporinga. Well, a little tongue-in-cheek, but, but the whole idea was very real. And in June, Tabby heard that the Guards Club the guard was moving from its premises on at 70 pound mile pictured here to a new building in Brook Street. He immediately set his eye on taking over this building for, for Tok H, but the leaseholders, the London City and Midland Bank, uh, they had other ideas and Tubby's plan was thwarted. So looking elsewhere, he turned to Red Lion Square. Now he knew Red Lion Square because his sister Belle had taken up lodgings there during the, the war. And Tubby often stayed there during his leave. And in late 1919, he rented a five room apartment on the top floor of 36 Red Lion Square. Now this is the only photo I've been able to find of 36, of 36 Red Lion Square. It's the building in the middle, in the little box focus there. Uh, Bell's apartments were actually to the left of that on the, the very end of the building, St George's Mansions. Um, but Tubby uh, opened up what was effectively Mark Nought Nought, um, and it was here the first Tock H hostelers or marksmen lived, which was Tubby, Arthur Pettifer, Herbert Shiner, George Sprague and Frank Wilkins. And there were a constant stream of foundation members or Torbatowsians coming to this address because Tubby had sent out his famous whiz bangs and they turned up the building and they gained attention by pulling on a piece of string which dangled from the top floor down to a few feet off the pavement. Attached to it, there was a, um, in Tubby's handwriting, a luggage tag reading, Tok H, Torbat House, once of Poboringa and Ypres. And they tugged on that to gain entry. Excuse me. Well, there's no piece of string anymore. In fact, there's no 36 Red Lion Square anymore because the Luftwaffe put paid to it on the night of the 10th and the 11th of May, 1941. Um, 
they reduced it to rubble and the council cleared the rubble away. Um, actually, there is a 36 red lines where it's been rebuilt now. I think it's like the School of Psychologists or something. But it was clear anyway that uh, Red Line Square was not going to be big enough for what Tubby had in mind. Um, and so when it came to light that a wartime organisation, the Anglo-South American Committee, had reached the end of its useful life and, and it held properties in Kensington, a delegation approached the committee's head, Dame Guthrie Reed, and she agreed to rent one of these properties, number eight Queensgate Place, to Doc H. And there it is, as she is today. The proposal was discussed at a meeting of the newly formed Executive Committee on the 23rd of December 1919. Bear in mind, this is just one month after the first committee meeting at the end of November. Uh, and it was announced as a done deal in no less an organ than the Times on the 12th of January 1920. And they actually moved in, in about March 1920. Now, there is another story in which Tubby dispatched Harry Moss to Dame Guthrie Reed's house um, to ask her to give number eight rent free for six months. Harry knocked on the door and was persuaded uh, the person who answered to let him see the lady. But he was astonished to find that despite having been in Flanders, she'd not heard of either Tubby or Talbot House. So he borrowed the house telephone and summoned Tubby himself. He arrived shortly afterwards in a cycle car and took himself off with the lady for a conversation and emerged shortly afterwards declaring they had the house rent free for a year. Now, the first explanation was related by Barclay Barron and the last one probably propagated by Tubby. So I think I know which version I'm inclined to believe. However, after only a few weeks, it was clear that this house was not going to be big enough. And so in May, the residents did a moonlight flit 60 yards to the west to a much larger property at 23 Queensgate Gardens, um, a magnificent corner property that had formerly been Lady Amherst Wool Depot during the war. An impressive house. Uh, the basement was a kitchen and mess room for the 25 original hostels who lived there. On the ground floor, there was a lounge with billiards and table tennis. And, and Barclay Baron said that even the passing postman might pop in for a quick game and knock with the queue. The stairs up were lined with pictures, mostly of fallen comrades, and they led up to a chapel and the club room on the first floor. Now, it was a very important part of the Tok H ethos that every mark contained a chapel. And on Ascension Day 1920, May the 13th, Mark I received the most precious chapel of all. Arriving in London via the ordination schools at Le Tourque and Nutsford, the old carpenter's bench and the rest of the chapel fittings from Talbot House were installed in the mark. Um, an oak shield on the club room wall bore the arms of the Green Howards and recalls that the room was a memorial gift from the regiment. This was a, a common and important factor of the masks. Several, if not all of the rooms would be dedicated to a person or regiment and they'd be paid for by someone wishing to pay tribute. Certainly the bedrooms of Mark I, which uh, filled the top three floors, uh, all bore the names of the fallen. One of these was Alan's room and this room contained a bound book of letters sent from the front by a lieutenant. Um, unfortunately, or poignantly, the last letter is from his CO informing his mother of her son's death. Sadly, the article I read didn't give us any more information about the lieutenant, except that his first name was Alan. Now, the men living in the hostels were not normally domesticated, and so board was thrown in with the lodgings. And the marks, therefore, required living stewards or housekeepers, often a husband and wife, to do the cooking and, do, and other chores. Later on, the bigger marks would have even more paid um, domestic staff. But otherwise, the mark was run by an unpaid honorary warden appointed from the, within the hostelers by the Tok H executive, although later on the house itself would, would elect their own wardens. Um, he appointed a deputy and there was also an unpaid secretary and every mark was expected to have a padre who received a stipend from a special fund. Now the first warden at Mark 1 in Queensgate was Colonel Herbert Shiner and he remained in post for a year. So Mark I was perfectly happy in Queensgate as it watched its brother Mark springing up, as we'll find out shortly. But in 1927, it had to move. And when 24 Pembridge Gardens in Notting Hill Gate was anonymously purchased for them, they moved here. Just over a mile north-northwest of their current home, um, it was in, in Notting Hill. Now the storming party, which was the title marksmen tended to give to the earliest hostelers in a mark, arrived at the house on Monday the 4th of July 1927, just a few days after the stewards, Commander and Mrs Borgat, took possession of the house. 
It was incomplete chaos, and the storming party's job was to get it into some sort of shape before the rest of the marksmen arrived. Now, we know this in some detail because a diary was kept from the house, and I just want to read you a few short extracts from this diary. Starting with the normal, on Tuesday, September the 20th, 1927, General Tim Harrington visited the new house with Tubby prior to his departure for India. The house was now looking quite normal and the chapel nearly ready. Then the slightly strange, Sunday, January the 1st, 1928. Hector and Lassiter were seen emerging from Pembridge Gardens armed with heavy knives. Though their intentions were misinterpreted by both Dicko and the house cat, they were really off to assist in sandwich cutting for the Dockland boys' bean feast at St John's Hall. And then some things that probably shouldn't be written down. Thursday, June the 13th, 1929. Oswald was assisted through the door tonight at an hour, again long past his usual bedtime. He then spent a happy ten minutes wandering round the office, a beatific smile overspreading his face and muttering whoosh, whoosh, whoosh at irregular intervals. So Mark I remained happily in Pembridge Gardens for the next 40 years. But in the late 60s, it needed to reinvent itself. Now, it sat in the middle of Notting Hill, with it, which had a then a huge West Indian population. And Mark I decided it could best serve the community as an international centre. From this point on, the story of Mark I is a remarkable one, but a lot of it isn't directly related to Top H. I intend to tell this story in a, in a blog next year sometime. But for now, just the briefest of histories in its, of, of its final days as a Mark. Um, in July 1968, after a period of closure, it reopened, but it was now a self-catering hostel and had much fewer, uh, fewer residents. It began working even more closely with the local community, and among the residents in 1969 was Selwyn Baptiste. He was one of the founders of the Notting Hill Carnival. He worked at the local playground and got the kids involved in a steel band, which was his speciality. Another marksman, Keith Gaskin, worked as a legal advisor to the Interracial Committee, a local organisation who worked for offices in Mark I. And also working at the basement for a short while was the Notting Hill Press, who produced leaflets and newspapers for the black community. Two of the wardens around this time were Chris Holmes, who went on to run Shelter, and this chap, Frank Bailey, who had been London's first post-war black fireman, and he went on to become a social worker and a trade union rep, and he's so well known now that he even had his own Google Doodle quite recently. However, by February 1971, Tock H had decided to close the mark down and they leased it to the Notting Hill Social Council. And when the, this lease expired around 1973, they put it up for sale. They were unsuccessful, so instead they earmarked £12,000 to bring it up to standard and turn it into a self-catering hostel for Bangladeshi students. Now, Tokaj had already made huge connections with the nascent Bangladesh nation, both on Tower Hill and in Notting Hill, mainly thanks to the work of Peter East. It is said that it was in the basement of Mark I that the Bangladeshi Action Committee plotted the independence of the nation. Uh, and certainly the first High Commission was based here at 24 Pembridge Gardens. Around about 1977, the Bangladesh Centre was established as a joint venture between Tokh and the Bangladeshi community, and it remains there to this day, although Tokh are no longer involved. They sold the building for £165,000 in 1983. Oh, and uh, 23 Queensgate Gardens has been subdivided into flats. They sell between £600,000 and £1.5 million each. So back to the early days. Mark I was closely followed in September 1920, by Mark II, the houses in Pimlico that were gifted by the Duke of Westminster in memory of his mother, Sybil Mary, Countess Grosvenor. Uh, situated close to the embankment at 123 St George's Square, it was formerly the London home of Henry Cubitt, second Baron Ashcombe. Tokhage paid a peppercorn rent and were actually, in 1929, granted a lease of 999 years. Not only was it the second hostel, but it also became Tokhage headquarters for a while, remaining so until they moved to a a purpose, uh, to a uh, dedicated office at Queen Anne's Gate in February 1926. They were also gifted the house next door, but rather than occupy it, they chose to rent it and to benefit from the rents. Now, <clears throat> among the memorial rooms in Mark II was Bernard's room. Bernard was Bernard George Norton, who died on the 6th of April 1917. 
He was in the choir at Talbot House and was the chap who painted the signboard which hung outside the old house. This signboard was actually transferred to Mark II where it hung before going back to Cockburn when the house was returned. That's actually it. You can see poking into the left-hand picture at the top and we've got a side-on view of it in the uh, second picture on the right. Um, actually, they were unv un unveiling this bigger sign that you can see explaining, explaining the story a little. Um, another room Mark II was the trench room, and we are lucky to have one of Barclay Barron's fabulous little sketches which uh, show us what this room would have looked like. Barron sketched all sorts of things during his tenure um, as the editor on the on the journal and before. It's very useful for, for seeing things as they were. Anyway, Mark II was... Oh, sorry. <coughs> um, Mark II was also a strong sporting house. One of its residents was a keen poet who I blogged about recently, Geoffrey Batchelor, and he organised the Top Age Rugger Sevens competition from 1927 onwards. And this that's his brother, top right, Dennis Batchelor, who was a, a very good sports person for Top H. Um, and Mark II continued, and unlike his elder brother, it never moved from, from its original base. But in 1969, it underwent a major refurbishment and it had to run for six months with only six residents instead of 40, which crippled it financially. Now, I think this is perhaps a very good time to remember that the point of these lectures is to help Talbot House out. Talbot House, of course, has been running for a year nearly without its normal income flow. So if you haven't made a donation yet, and if you can do, please do so. Mark II was eventually sold, I think it was used for a while as accommodation for nurses from Great Ormond Street Hospital. Um, it's still there, the building, but I believe it's private flats. Mark III, so the beginnings of Mark III were in the shadow of Waterloo Station, opposite the General Lying In Hospital at Lambeth. Uh, on the corner of Guildford Street stood number 148 York Road. The caption on this picture is actually wrong. Um, it was a big grimy house that acted as the vicarage for St John the Evangelist Church in Waterloo Road. And when John Woodhouse was inducted into the living in January 1921, he found it too big for his needs and moved into a much smaller property. Being a member of Tock H, he arranged for the movement to lease it from the church and the hostel opened on the 21st of May 1921. It was smaller than its brothers and, and the only one south of the river at the time, so it was often known as the Cinderella Mark. But it survived nine years in Lambeth until London County Council stuck their oar in. They wanted to extend County Hall and uh, compulsory purchase orders were in the offering. Offing. So in early 1930, Tock H dispersed its marksmen across the London marks and they temporarily moved their HQ into this building while they were waiting for new offices in Francis Street to be ready. But the story of Mark III was far from over. They Thanks to the generosity of their friends at Punch, the Mark crossed the river and decamped to South Hackney. So Owen Seaman, the editor of Punch and a great friend of Tock H, launched an appeal to the louds of the former rectory uh, on Church Crescent to be purchased for the movement, and it was renamed Punch House in their honour. Mark III continued to exist relatively quietly in Hackney for the 1930s, but by 1939, in common with the rest of the Marks, it suffered as young men were called to war, and in December 1939, the last of the residents moved out and it was mothballed. Uh, in 1940, it stood empty and badly bombed, but it did reopen in 1947. And by April 1949, it was back to full capacity, um, officially reopening in April 1950. But refurbished or not, there was no getting away from the fact that the building was still a Victorian rectory. So a bold plan was fashioned um, to replace it with Tock H's first purpose-built mark. This mark was to have 12 three bedrooms along with quarters for the warden, the padre, a separate suite for the housekeeper and our assistant. There'd be a wide array of rooms meeting the hostel as every need from the ubiquitous chapel to a dark room. <clears throat> so the last guest night of old Mark III was held on the 29th of November 1960. The mark closed on the 10th of December and demolition started five days later. Once complete, the new Prudhoe House, named for Lancelot Prudhoe Bruin, was a much modernised hostel. Um, many of the rooms were named for contributors to the appeal, but perhaps the most poignant was the Owl 12 room. It was endowed by Mrs Alexander Louise Gray in memory of 12 members of her family who gave their lives during the First World War. 
Freedom House was opened by the Queen, Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother on Friday the 1st of June 1962. Tabby of course in attendance. And perhaps the most important figure in Mark III's long life was Gorta de Mello. That's him on the right there with Neville Minus in the middle and my wife Hazel on the left. Um, he, Galter joined Toc H in his native Brazil in 1953 and was initiated by Alison McPhee while she was on her travels in South America. In 1957, Galter spent a year at Mark I whilst he was acting as Tubby's weekend ADC, and then he spent some time at the brother's house where he would have met Neville, who was warden there. After doing some, uh, his theological training at Ely, Galter was ordained in St Paul's, and in 1964, he took a curacy at St John of Jerusalem Church in South Hackney, just across the road from the Mark. He became the padre for the Mark when he moved in there in September 64, and when his curacy finished, he became the warden as well as the padre. To understand the work of Prudhoe House under Galter, I can do no better than suggest you seek out a copy of Ken Prudhoe Bruin's Any Problem Is No Problem, which is a book published in 1996. What follows now, just a quick glance. Um, under Galter's guidance, Prudhoe House began to turn from a hostel into a community centre. He ran the house really successfully, but he did clash with the Toc H executive over his vision. And this actually led him to leave, leaving the mark for a while, and a succession of wardens ran it in his place. But then in 1982, as Toc H disposed of the marks, Galter was able to buy it for a new charity he'd set up. And to cut a long story short, he could run the community house as he always wanted to. <clears throat> Strictly speaking, Prudhoe House was now no longer part of Toc H. Nonetheless, the links were strong and the ethos similar on so many levels that the spirit of Toc H continued and continues still. In terms of hard facts, the most significant change came in 2002 when Prudhoe House was torn down and the new Prudhoe House, this one here, rose in its place. In 2013, Galter retired to Brazil and sadly died just three years later. One era had ended, but a new one has begun. So we'll end the story of Toc H Mark III here, but what a journey it has had from its grimy beginnings in Lambeth to its place in the heart of South Hackney's community. The Cinderella Mark actually turned out to be the fairest of them all. So what was life in a Mark all about? Well, it was a lot more than just board and lodgings. As well as paying rent, the marksmen always also agreed to do some form of service in the community. This was a way of life that Tubby and many others had experienced as students when they lived and worked in settlements like the Oxford and Bermondsey Medical Mission. It might mean helping out with a boys club or with a Rover Scout group, um, but Toc H hostels were also part of the fledgling blood transfusion screen, running or pedalling furiously to the local hospital to lay next to someone who required a blood transfusion. A branch would be established in each house and would hold regular meetings. It wasn't compulsory for marksmen to be members of Toc H, but it was certainly encouraged. Um, each house also had a, a guest night weekly, which involved an expert coming along to give a talk to the hostlers and welcoming visiting members from other marks and branches. Non-members were also invited as a way of uh, encouraging new recruits. The social side of living in a mark was very important. Mealtimes were communal and there were regular suppers where guests were invited and there was always tea at 10 before bed. We've already mentioned um, sports teams that were formed in the Marks, um, particularly football and rugby and athletics. Competition between the Marks was taken very seriously. Toc H acquired a sports ground at Folly Farm in Barnet, where a lot of the battles took place. Uh, other activities, such as the Toc H Drama League, that began in the Marks. Later on, the Toc H Male Voice Choir began at Mark II. And sometimes there were very special events. What did Mark III ever do for us? Well, provided Romans and um, for the annual pageant on Tower Hill, the clash between the Romans and the Iceni, the Iceni being the scouts and guides from East Anglia who came there. And this was a, an event presumably driven by Tubby. So now let's hear from a few people who lived in the Marks. John Mitchell, the man responsible for getting me and my wife together. We met on one of his projects. Uh, wrote a few words for me. I went to live in Toc H Mark II, a Toc H hostel for men situated on the embankment in Pimlico. My father was heavily involved in Toc H locally and knew about these hostels that Toc H ran for young men in big cities and felt it would be a good place to start. He was right, but the word hostel is very misleading. 
It was very much more than just a hostel. It was a real lively and welcoming community. The mark had a practice that when a new marksman arrived, an older hand would be asked to host them for the first week. I was greeted soon after arrival by Nick, who was to be my host. He showed me round, introduced me to others, and for the first week made sure that I never had to walk into the dining room alone and always sat with me. This was a huge gift to a rather shy young man. It also taught me a good tuck age lesson, that if you do not plan welcomes, people can drop through the net, however much goodwill there is in the community. From that early experience, I learned that this was far removed from an ordinary hostel. Mark II was a very good experience. In those days before privacy and en suites had become considered essential, people shared bedrooms. I did so with two men who beca both became lifelong friends. I think it was because quite often, after we had put out the light, we would chat in the dark, and often people at that late hour share things more deeply than in casual daytime chat. There was Malcolm from Somerset, and together we made an epic hitchhiking holiday to the south of France in 1957, including seeing the Grand Prix in Monaco. The other friend, Tony, came from Pudsey, talked with a broad West Riding accent and was at the time a young communist. For me, who had had a fairly sheltered public school type life and never really met any Northerners, Tony was a shock. He wore a vest in bed and I had never seen anyone not wearing pyjamas before. Two years after leaving Mark II, I lived for six months or so at Mark 22 in Denmark Hill. This was one of the smaller marks with just 28 beds compared to the 40 or so at Mark II. Its main attraction was that it had links with nearby nurses' homes and we were always invited to their dances and that led to some very happy times. Then in 1965-66, I lived at Mark I in Notting Hill Gate. I went there in a rush as I had been living above a boys' club which I co-ran with a policeman and a probation officer, both friends made at Mark II, in a condemned building in a very rough part of Paddington. One night when I was away, some lads who were a bit annoyed with me broke into my flat and wrecked it. I phoned Mark 1 to see if I could stay there for a bit, and a few weeks turned into a very happy 18 months. Bob Collis lived at Mark 3 York Road. Mark 3 itself was a poor, dusty house looking out on a noisy, dirty street. It consisted of a basement where food was cooked and where we ate, and a common room above, and a large number of rooms used as dormitories in which were from two to six beds. Their furniture was scarce, but they were fitted out pleasantly if roughly. Washing accommodation was sufficient if crowded. One small back room had been reserved. It was made into a chapel. Whoever decorated it was an artist. It was plain except for a few benches and a communion table. There was a wooden cross which had been brought back from Flanders, a communion roll and a round window of stained glass reconstructed, pardon me, actually of pieces from the shattered windows of the Cathedral of Ypres and arranged so as to represent the double cross of the Flanders town. It faced away from the street. In it there was a stillness or as near absolute quiet as can be obtained in London, for even in places where the hooting of the traffic and all crude sounds are shut off, there is still always a distant rumble, which is felt rather than heard. Here, it was possible to be alone. Indeed, in later years, when no longer living in Tok H, I have more than once entered Mark III quietly and climbed up to the little back room seeking peace from London. <coughs> this final account by a marksman comes from Gibson, who lived in Mark I during the Second World War. For the first few nights, we all stayed in our rooms at Mark I. I was on the second floor. But as the bombing got worse and its results more obvious, we all agreed that that was foolish and that we had better sleep in the sitting room on the ground floor, which we did. It meant, of course, we had no beds, only mattresses, but we also did not have the naked feeling we had higher up. One night in particular, there was a most dreadful clattering noise which we could not understand. We recognised easily the crump of exploding bombs on mines, but this noise was like a lot of exploding fireworks, which it nearly literally was. About 20 or 30 incendiary bombs had fallen on Pembridge Gardens. We could see at least that number in the street and gardens, each giving a brilliant light which sparkled and spluttered. About five or six was ran out to help extinguish the bombs. We were helped by the ARP po post which had occupied half our basement. We were more concerned with those bombs which were indoors as most of those outdoors could blaze away probably harmlessly. 
I'm afraid that over half the members of TOC H Mark I did not go out that night, preferring the comparative safety of the building. Peter Marchant and I discovered that there were two bombs in the top floor of number 28, and we managed to deal with both with sandbags we took upstairs. Okay, so now let's go back to the early days and the drive for houses continued. In 1921, a new appeal was made, and in April 1922, largely due to this appeal, the first provincial mark opened in Manchester. Talbot House in Pat Leonard was shipped up from Cheltenham Ladies College to run things. Gartness was a huge old house on Upper Park Road, just east of Moss Side. It was actually a hostel for theological students before Top H acquired it. And indeed, on the 19th February 1921, it was the venue for a meeting um, chaired by William Temple where Tubby outlined the aims of Top H. A year later, the house was theirs. It was described as being built by a Christmas card designer because of its ivy covered walls. And Pat and the other hostelers dug out the old cellar to create a beautiful chapel. The house was blessed by Neville Talbot on the 28th of April 1923, officially opening the next day. Tubby was away, but a telegram arrived from him. My brotherly love to every member. What Manchester does tonight, Bristol will attempt in May, Leicester in June and Glasgow and Toronto in their turn. I come to your next meeting when I expect to hear you are getting busy over the second Manchester house. The dining room was added as an extension in 1926 and was a memorial to the 42nd East Lancashire Division. And these are some of the memorial plaques from Gartness, which are now in a museum. Um, and that's the chapel itself. And then in 1969, on 15th of November, Sir Matt Busby, no less, opened a further extension to uh, Gartness, Mark IV. <clears throat> These proceedings were relayed to local hospitals through the hospital radio facilities that Toc H had there. They'd actually had a purpose-built studio in the new wing. Now we're going to be talking a little bit more about Toc H's involvement with hospital radio very shortly. The Gartness was closed and put up for sale in 1983. It was pulled down in 2007 and they built a mosque next door. At present the site is vacant and it's used for car parking. But perhaps the most lasting memorial of Mark IV was a rugby team. In 1924, members of the Mark formed a rugby club, which they called Toc H Manchester. Um, but after moving around through various sites, the club arrived at Didsbury. And in 1986, the name changed to Didsbury Toc H, which is very much a still an active club today. So Southampton followed next after an advert appeared in the Times in August 1922, stating that the owner of a medium sized house with six acres of beautiful grounds might be disposed to give it to a religious or charitable institution if satisfied as to the use to which it would be put. It was essential, the advert continued, that the house should be used as a permanent memorial to one who fell and preferably for the benefit of those hurt in the war. Well the house was the Furs at 574 Winchester Road in Bassett. The owner was Walter Southwell Jones and the man who fell in the war was his son, Second Lieutenant Louis Jones who was born in the house and died 20th of June 1917 in France. Tubby happened to be staying at Little Hatchet, his family's home nearby, and he shot across to see Southwell Jones and by January 1923 Mark V was opened. Lewis Jones' old bedroom was turned into the chapel. It was a bit classier than some of its urban brothers, boasting the tennis courts and no less than three bowling greens and a one and a half acre wood. Some of the bedrooms even had ensuite WCs, which was virtually unheard of in the UK at the time. Now, during its life, this mark was connected with one particular piece of Toc H work that actually needs a lot more research, and that is hospital radio, in particular football commentaries. Its origins were a little hazy, with several branches and one or two other organisations claiming its genesis. We believe, though, it started through the work with the blind that Toc H was well known for where a sighted person would take a blind person to a football match and describe the action to them. Um, th from this came the idea of broadcasting a commentary down the telephone lines to local hospitals, and it developed from there. In 1966, Southampton Hospital Radio started broadcasting live from the old wine cellar under the mark, um, a complete programme service, including newscasts and children's programmes. In August 1971, they raised £9,000 to build a, a a single story, two studio building in the cabbage patch and they moved above ground. Um, 
alongside the Tok H Youth Hostel, which I think was in the stable block. <coughs> Indeed, after the mark closed, the house continued to be served serve as a Tok H centre. Um, some of it was the house, I think, was demolished earlier uh, than the stable block, but everything was demolished in 1978 and replaced by new housing. The only sign or remembrance of um, Tok H is that one of the roads there is called Talbot Close. Now, we've seen 1922 was a very busy year for the Marks and the race to get new houses open was competitive. As we find Mark 7 opening ahead of Mark 6. All Hallows House at 15 Fitzroy Square in Bloomsbury opened on the 7th of November 1922 with Jack Clark from Mark 2 as the warden. Tabby had actually acquired it on the tail end of a short lease in his guise as Vicar of All Hallows, but he allowed Tok H to stay there as his tenant at will. In 1923, an anonymous female donor gave £6,000 for Tok H to buy the house. This was almost certainly the Queen, Mary Tech, but don't tell anyone. In the autumn of 1929, the house extended into 15 Richardson's Mews behind it, and they opened a new club room. Uh, Mark 7 had a long life. It existed um, until 1982, and the building is still there, but once again, it's now private flats. So slightly out of order, Mark 6 came along just after Mark 7 in 1923, originally at 71 Newell Street in Birmingham. Uh, this house, also known as Cathedral House, was leased from the Boys and Girls Union and they continued to share the house with Tok H. They had a cellar chapel here that was named Arras because it apparently looked like the 11th Division cellar chapel in Arras in 1918 and it included the altar frontal from Poppering. But the house was too small for both organisations, so Tok H set out to find another Birmingham house and in the spring of 1925 took over a disused pub, the Alhambra, at 77 Clifford Street. Unfortunately, I don't have um, a picture of this one. The beer cellar was used to recreate the little cellar chapel of Arras uh, and apparently was even more beautiful than before and was considered the powerhouse of Tok H in Birmingham. It officially opened on Friday the 13th of November and the chapel was dedicated by Bishop Talbot, Neville and Gilbert's father, Edward. And they stayed there until 1936 when they moved to this impressive property in Mosley at Six Wake Green Road. Um, this house was officially opened on the 18th of January 1937 by the Lord Mayor. It was gifted to Tok H by Sir Herbert Austin, the founder of Austin Motors. Uh, in memory of his son Vernon and he un unveiled a commemorative plaque at the opening. There were rooms for 14 residents and a warden but the ground floor of the house was kept for community use which included the Mosley and District Drama Group who were renowned for their performances of Shakespeare's plays in an amphitheatre in the garden and in many ways Mark Six's most exciting room was the huge garden which also included an adventure playground with aerial walkways. There were also outbuildings which contained offices and a, a bunk room for putting up volunteers. The Mark had long gone self-catering and it was in fact repurposing itself as a community house. They sold it in 1973-74 on the understanding that Tok H could continue to use it for two years, but then they moved again to 24 Grove Avenue, but now it was no longer a Mark. Something entirely different, but something very much of the time. So this uh, Christmas um, slide from 1924 just shows the growth of Tok H. This is the branches and the marks all mixed in there. Uh, bear in mind, this is five years since the organization started and it's already covering the country. Now we'll have a little break from the race for houses and we're gonna talk a, a bit about the people who lived in them. Uh, it was always Tubby's intention that the marks and therefore by extension Tok H was to be a human zoo, a mixture of chaps and fellas from all walks of life. He even had a written breakdown of how he wanted the houses to be made up, which was a balance of seniors, 25 to 35 year olds, who would be lawyers, doctors, businessmen, actors, the intermediates, 20 to 25 year olds, made up of bank officers, clerks, assistant secretaries, junior civil servants, students, 19 plus, students of theology, medicine, arts, engineering, the industrial chaps, or again, 19 plus typesetters, railway men, storehands, mechanics, and then the nursery, the 16 to 19 year old youngsters, lately from school, beginning life as apprentices in various trades. And the nursery actually existed in most of the marks, um, the room where the youngest hostlers were all bunked. And in the 50s, one marksman was showing a new hostel around and he introduced 
it as such. This is the room you'll be in for the time being. We call it the nursery. The chap in the bed next to yours is a pole. The one in this bed, a West African study in textiles. Over there, a tubby chap, chap in the bank. And in the corner, Jimmy, a printer's devil. Already you can see the diversity that H. Marx's were, were being made up with. So now we're going to take a look at a few random marksmen, some of whom we've already mentioned in passing. Morris Oxo Oxenbold was a private in the Liverpool Scottish um, in 1914, but a competent footballer, he was gazetted into the Middlesex Regiment Football Battalion in 1915. He was a warden and treasurer at Mark I, and he also lived in Mark II. And then in 1926, he married Mabel Pito at All Hallows with tubby officiating and this photo shows their slightly unconventional departure for their honeymoon from the tower steps. Henry Willink was in charge of a heavy gun battery outside Ypres and on Good Friday 1917 attended a service in the ruins of Ypres prison. The padre delivering that service was one tubby Clayton and they chatted and Clayton invited Willink to Talbot House for the service on Easter Sunday which he went to. In 1920, Willink was called to the bar and he moved into Mark I as one of the first hostlers. He spent six months there before moving into Mark II and then in May 1921, he went to Mark III as warden. He remained as a warden and hostler until September 1922 when he moved into Temple uh, near his chambers, but his association from to with Tock Age was far from over. Willink became the chairman of the South London Area Committee and the London Executive and in 1934 became the chairman of the Central Executive. The following year he took silk and in 1940 was elected as a Conservative MP. During the wartime coalition government he was made Minister of Health. At this time, 1944, he regretfully stood down from the Central Executive Chair. He retired from politics to become the Master of Magdalen College um, but retained his Tock H connections and he was very supportive of the campaign to raise funds to rebuild Mark III. And he died New Year's Day 1973, just a fortnight after Tubby. Bob Collis joined the British Army in 1918 as a cadet, but resigned a year later to study medicine in London, which is when he stayed at Mark III. He went on to become the first president of Tock H London. Then after qualifying, he was appointed director of paediatrics at the Rotunda Hospital in Dublin, and he played rugby for Ireland whilst he was there. During the Second World War, he worked for the Red Cross um, and was in the bergen delson concentration camp after it was liberated. He was instrumental in bringing five orphaned children from the camp to Ireland in 1947 and adopted two of them, hence his later reputation as the Irish Schindler. He also was involved in establishing cerebral palsy Ireland and worked closely with Christy Brown of My Left Foot fame. Now Sam Pickles was perhaps the most colourful character in early Tock H, a charming fop of a lad. He was born in Huddersfield in 1894 and at some point decided to train for holy orders found himself under the Reverend Charles Neville of Cleckheaton. And then the war broke out. Like most young men of his age, Pickles enlisted and found himself in the Royal Field Artillery. It wasn't a glorious career. At some point, at one stage, Corporal Pickles found himself reverted in rank for misconduct. Nonetheless, he was described in Tock Age literature as a square-built gunner of a man. Square-built gunner from Yorkshire. On the 1st of October 1918, at the age of 24, he married Helena Roberts, a woman some 13 years older than himself. And then after armistice, he went to La Torque, the first ordination school set up by Tubby, and followed him to Nutsford. He was, by all accounts, the life and soul of the theological training school in the old Nutsford jail, but he failed academically. This presumably is how he and Helena found themselves snared by Tubby to be stewards and housekeepers of the first marks. This was not to be his life, though, and at Tubby's suggestion, Pickles, who had done some acting when he was younger, had taken evening classes and won a scholarship to RADA. He graduated in 1925 alongside John Gilgood, Charles Lloyd Pack and Alan Napier. And it was Napier, most famous for playing the butler Alfred Pennyworth in the 60s TV series Batman, who adds a twist to our tale of Sam Pickles. In his autobiography, Napier notes that Pickles was somewhat older than the rest of the class and also described him as a pixie with more attractiveness than talent. They shared a flat at 37 Belgrave Road in Pimlico and here Napier observed that Pickles had a wife much older than himself who looked in from time to time, but he was quite clear about the fact that Pickles was in fact gay. 
At the suggestion of Sybil Thorndyke, Sam Pickles changed his name to Peter Ridgway in a bid to be taken more seriously. And probably his most significant contribution to the acting world was the founding of the Players Theatre with Leonard Sachs in 1936, a famous musical which survives to this day. Um, perhaps our Mr Pickles might have achieved more, but sadly he was taken from us with TB on the 21st of November 1938, aged just 44 years old. Oh, and remember our knife wielder, Bertram Jack Lassiter? Well, in 1953, he became the mayor of God Orming, so I guess he turned out okay. A quick look at the 1939 register also gives us an idea of who stayed in the marks in those days. This is Birmingham, um, almost as many staff as there are guests at this time, but very engineering orientated, an assistant plant engineer at an aircraft works, Ministry of Health inspector, a technical rep, a draftsman. Mark II was much busier and a slightly more mixed bunch, several war office civil servants being joined by clerks and even a couple of people from a margarine manufacturers, which I guess was the massive Maple Dairies factory in Southall. Dub is also pretty busy, filled with engineering apprentices, which is no surprise really given its location, which was close to the great engineering works of Rolls-Royce, the Midland Railway and others. And Woolwich, um, only a handful of marksmen, but quite unsurprisingly, all but one work at the Royal Arsenal. And so, back to the houses. Um, chronologically, by John Nixon of Poppering and Nutswood fame. Um, he was also a Rotarian, and the Rotary Club did a lot to assist Barham raise the money. And it was almost certainly in relation to this appeal that Tubby and Barham were sitting in a Bristol stockbroker's office waiting for an appointment when they discussed the idea of a symbol for Toc H and Baron, Baron suggested an oil lamp. The appeal succeeded and Toc H moved into their houses, which was actually two houses knocked into one, on St Paul's Road in March 1923. Uh, it officially was opened in June, this is the official opening in the picture. It stood just 200 yards from uh, Baron's family home, or former family home in White Ladies Road, and one of the bedrooms is dedicated to Sir Barclay J. Barron, the eminent ENT surgeon and the father of our Barclay Barron. In 1944, Mark Nine moved to 16 Cotton Park or Ashley Down House, formerly the Hampton House School, but they'd been evacuated some years before. One of the big activities that came out of this mark was the Bristol Tock H Film Unit. Um, it was they took a projector around and showed films in hospitals, youth clubs, care homes, etc. This was a big part of Toc H's work in the, in the 40s and 50s. And perhaps it was no surprise that one of the local members was Frank Gillard, a renowned broadcaster, who was later partly responsible for getting BBC Bristol's Natural History Film Unit established. But he's also well remembered in Toc H as the broadcaster who reported on the liberation of Poppering and Talbot House in 1944. But by 1955, this mark was in terrible disrepair. An appeal was launched to save it, but it was to no avail and it was closed before the decade was out. So Mark 8 in Sheffield opened a little behind schedule on July the 7th, 1923, the first birthday of the Sheffield branch. And this was opened by Lord Plumer, a president of Toc H. The house came about when Tubby was walking around Sheffield with Douglas Lang and six other foundation members of, Toc of Sheffield Toc H. Tubby spotted a suitable house and he waited for a nearby policeman to look the other way. Then he hurried over and chalked a cross on the door. Um, they obviously then acquired it. Um, Westwood in Christchurch Road, formerly the residence of Sir William Ellis, the civil engineer and steelmaker. Memorial rooms included the BB room, and no, not Barclay Baron on this case, but the Sheffield Battalion Boys Brigade. Later, um, there was a Douglas Leng room main, named for the aforementioned branch member who died aged 43. Captain Leng served in the Yorkshire Dragoons and he was a director of the Sheffield Telegraph. You can actually see the photo as Leng Limited as its copyright holder. Um, sadly, he died from gunshot wounds and it was presumed to have taken his own life. Now, Sheffield was a fairly short lived mark. It closed by 1938 or in 1938, but they did hang on to the house for some while as a centre for South York's division. Shortly after Sheffield and 50 miles away, Howell was opened by October 1923. Clarendon House at 40 Clarendon Street was the former home for, and wait for it, 
the Church of England incorporated society for providing homes for waifs and strays. The society later renamed itself to the less linguistically challenging Church of England Children's Society and survives today as simply as the Children's Society. This house was presented to Toc H by Colonel W. H. Carver, uh, later a Conservative MP and the leader of the Toc H group in the House of Commons. It officially opened on Friday the 25th of January 1924 a much was made during the opening ceremony of East Riding's role in the recovery of Gilbert Talbot's body, which Simon has talked about a few weeks ago. Um, they were led by a Sergeant Shepherd, or later a Regimental Sergeant Major Shepherd, and he was a member of TOC H and was present at the opening of this mark. But around 1931, the branch found they couldn't maintain it as a mark and it was delisted, but they kept it, the building for a while. Then in 1938, they reopened as a mark at a different site, Westbourne House in Prince's Avenue, but that one was closed permanently by the Luftwaffe in 1941, and Clarendon House hadn't survived either, and that's now a playing field. In August 1923, the Central Executive approved Leicester's request to buy Stonesby House at 44 Princess Street for £5,000. It belonged to Dr Donald, a friend of Toc H, and it was in De Montfort Square, in fact, it stood on a corner plot overlooking the gardens and was strongly reminiscent of Mark Wymock 23 Queensgate Gardens. Uh, Leicester opened on the 15th of October 1923, a week after the storming party had taken possession. And it was sold by Toc H in 1973, but the building is still there. Halifax was the next northern stronghold for Toc H and the mark was opened in a house called Shaw Royd on the corner of Sedbury Road and Shaw Hill Lane lately the home of Colonel Sir Edward Whitley, uh, himself a Toc H member. It was announced that Toc H would be acquiring in October 1923, and the storming party went in and got it ready so there could be a huge housewarming party on New Year's Eve 1923. It must have rounded off an amazing year for the marks in style. The house wasn't officially opened until the 22nd of February 1924, and then Tubby, Barkley Barron, Pat Leonard and Tim Harrington were all present. That's quite a cast of uh, Toc H bigwigs, if you like. It closed in December 1934, but it may have been downgraded from a mark as early as 1931, and the Shoreroid estate was sold by Toc H in 1939. Meanwhile, back in London, a new mark opened at 119 Kennington Park Road. Officially Mark 13, it's always known as the Brothers House, and the story of how it came to be gifted to Toc H is quite well known. Uh, Dick and Gus Dilberaglu were both at Eton, both captains of their houses, and both rode in the eights. They both went to war, and Dick fell on the 15th of September 1916 whilst leading his company of 1st Battalion Coldstream Guards. And his brother Gus was acting as adjutant to the 3rd King's Own Hussars when he died near Domart on the 1st of April 1918. So their mother gave this house in their memory. The gift was announced at the 1923 birthday festival and the house officially opened on the 13th of December 1924 by the Prince of Wales on the afternoon of the 1924 birthday festival. Here are some of the wardens there with Tubby. Now, as time went on, um, the Brothers House tended to attract slightly older marksmen and they tended to stay for much, much longer. Amongst them was the very much loved and respected Neville Minus, whose story I have told previously. Um, Neville was a, 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 as well as a marksman, he was an honorary warden there for several years. There were plans to refurbish it as a community house in 1982, but they didn't amount to anything, and it was sold for £96,000 in early 1983, and the building is still there today. Salford was next, and at Oakfield, in one, at One Eccles Old Road in Pendleton, it was presented to Toc H in 1923 by Henry Lee Groves in memory of his parents. Uh, Henry Lee Groves was for a long time the High Sheriff of Westmoreland and, and amongst his other acts of generosity was one in, where he bought the bed of Lake Windermere to give to Windermere Urban District Council. I'm sure that solved some problems for them, I'm not quite sure what. His parents were William and Eliza Ann Grimble Groves. William was part of a wealthy brewing family and he was one of two brothers who started Salford Lads Club in 1903. The house was dedicated on the 26th of November 1924 by the Lord Bishop of Manchester, having survived its first year as an experiment. 
One of the leading lights in Tokate Stalford was Michael Coleman, who later served as the Vicar of All Hallows while Tubby was in the Orkneys on war work. Uh, in 1943, Coleman went to work for Tokate in Canada and was canon at Christchurch Cathedral, Victoria, and later became the Bishop of Coupel um, in 1950. This mark was sold off in the late 60s, with the donor's permission to financially support Mark IV in Manchester. As early as 19, March 1924, the Central Executive were calling for a house in Woolwich as a base for the Reverend Hutchinson, who they'd just appointed as chaplain in South East London. By the 9th of May, they'd bought this property here, 31 The Common, or Kemp Terrace, uh, in Woolwich, now, now the South Circular. It's just two doors down from General Gordon's birthplace. Um, you can probably make out a blue plaque on the, on the first house on the left. Almost certainly built for the Board of Ordnance. Um, it officially opened on the 6th of December 1924 by Sir Acton Blake, who was Master of Trinity House. And it was listed on the 1941 annual report, but it was closed later that year and it was demolished in 1971 to accommodate the widening of the South Circular Road. Now, a spanner was thrown in the works of Mark's numbering because the next house to be opened at number three Jamaica Road in Bermondsey was designated number 22 in honour of the 22nd Queen's London Regiment opposite whose barracks it stood. Uh, Alec Patterson was one of the early drivers of Tock and he served in the Bermondsey Battalion of that regiment and the mark was named Alexander Patterson House. It was very much a Tock H mark but many of the first hostlers were drawn from the ranks of the Oxford and Bermondsey Club which operated in, in the area. The OBC was of course often called the cradle of Tock H. Charlie Thompson, who'd previously run a boxing club at Mark III, was involved with both Tock H and the OBC, and he made an obvious choice for Warden. Charlie was also a gents outfitter who supplied ties and blazer badges for Tock H for decades. The building was an old pawn shop right on the junction with Abbey Street, um, and it wasn't in remarkable condition when Tock H acquired it, and in 1927 they were forced to abandon it before it fell down. And then there was quite a discussion in the ensuing months about letting this tatty decrepit building become an eyesore with Tock H signs still attached to it. The, the great irony there was it actually remained standing for decades afterwards before finally being pulled down. There was a, a brief hiatus and then Mark 22 reopened in October 1928 but at 95 then Mark Hill some two and a half miles away. Um, in fact it didn't open properly until the 28th of May 1930 when it was renamed again Alexander Patterson House and it was opened by Lord and Lady Plumer. It was notably the first mark to have a garden of any size. Tockage moved out in the late 60s and in 1970 they leased it to the St Giles Centre a really social work in Camberwell before it was finally sold and the photo on the right here was taken in 1977 and I think it's been used as a shelter for girls by crisis at Christmas in that point. Swindon's house, Redville, was opened with some pomp and circumstance on the 10th of March 1923 by General Hunter Watson. However, it was listed as a hostel and unnumbered. Um, HQ refused to give it mark status because it lacked a chapel. Uh, finally, this was um, resolved and it was elevated to mark status in 1925. Uh, most of the hostels were apprentices with the Great Western Railway, whose engineering works, of course, dominated Swindon and had done since 1843. In September 1939, Mark 16, Swindon, actually became the headquarters of Tock H, which is why we can see on this list the names of Hubert Secretan, Jack Harrison, William Musters, Rob Shelston, um, all headquarters staff. But once the phony war ended, they went back to London and they remained there, in fact, during the Blitz and the rest duration of the war. So Mark 16's next claim to fame came at the end of 1967, when on the 30th of December, Hospital Radio Swindon began broadcasting from the cellar. Sadly, in 1976, a fire destroyed the studio and 3,000 records, but Top H stepped in and offered to build a studio on their land. Um, and by 1977, the studio was in full use. And in 1979, Swindon Hospital Broadcasting Society purchased the studio from Top H for £750,000. And around this time, the mark was taken over uh, as well by the Mental Health Aftercare Association. 
Now, the next mark, 17, was added somewhat quietly to the list in early 1925. I can't find any fanfare for it, and it didn't survive all that long, just until 1928 when its lease expired. It's really the forgotten mark. It was in the old parsonage on Hill Street in Itchin, um, and it was attached to it was the Guild House, uh, the recently opened headquarters of the Sea Scouts. And it was with the Sea Scouts and the Rover Scouts that the Mark would do most of their work. One interesting thing about the house is that a former tenant had paste, painted a little word or phrase over the doorway to each room, reading things like grace and truth, cheer, sincerity, fellowship, peace and love, all very fitting for Doc H. Now, Mark 17, which we can see here just the other side of the railway line, it stood only three miles from Mark 5 at Bassett and less than a mile across the river from the Talbot House Seagull and Boys Club in Southampton. So it probably contributed to its um, short life. And the building has long since gone. There was another appeal in 1925, which led to the acquisition of Greystoke at 34 Granger Park Road, Newcastle upon Tyne, which opened on the 17th of April, 1926 by Sir Charles Tim Harrington. Interestingly, Granger Park Row runs up to the course of Hadrian's Wall, which must have quite pleased Tubby with his love of history and his piece of London Wall in the basement of the Vicarage, which we'll talk about a bit later. It was small in comparison to um, most marks. Greystoke only slept eight initially, and its study was a memorial for Mark Noble. Noble was one of the very first Boy Scouts who, with his brother Humphrey, attended Baden Powell's experimental camp on Brown Sea Island in 1907. Noble died on the 1st of July, 1917, in France, and his nephew, also Mark, went on to become a leading light in the Scout movement. In 1940, this became a services club, um, and it was still a Mark, and went back to Mark status after the war, but Tokage left it um, in the early 50s, needing bigger premises. This building actually was taken over by St John's Ambulance and was renamed St John House. And meanwhile, um, in 1951, Mark 18 was reopened at Glendin in Jesmond Park West, and it remained there until final closure in 1969. That one has been demolished and replaced by um, new housing, but the original still remains. It also a software company now, I think. The Red House settlement on East Street Leeds stood very near to the river and opposite some factories. It was founded as a settlement in 1913, and by 1924, the local Tock H branch were working with the Boys Club there. In January 1927, there was some prospect of Toc H taking over the Red House settlement, and in mid-1928, it came on Toc H's books as a hostel. Then on the 4th of October 1929, it was opened by Lord Middleton as Mark 19. Uh, the Archbishop later dedicated a new chapel in the old wine cellar. In truth, the Red House was always more of a hostel than a true Mark, which is why it drops off the list again and why another mark is required in Leeds, which we'll come to shortly. There were no residents in 1939, but it was still operating as a community building, particularly um, a long running poor man's lawyer service. It officially closed as a mark in the 40s, and in 1951, it was requisitioned by the local authorities as a day nursery. The chapel had been used as an air raid shelter during the war, but was reinstated as a chapel in 1949, and Leeds branch were allowed to continue using the house on Monday nights for their branch meetings. London's eighth and final mark opened in Putney at 67 Upper Richmond Road in 1930. Worth noting that marks were so important at this time that they were marked as such on Ordnance Survey maps. You see there just off the centre, Toch H Mark 20 House. Um, this was originally called Meeburn House, and it was once the home of Sir John Thwaites, the first chairman of the Metropolitan Board of Works, the man credited with the development of the embankment. It sustained extensive damage during World War II, but it survived, and on the 10th of June 1967, a new extension was opened by Mark Bonham Carter. He was the first chairman of the Race Relations Board, also Helena's uncle, and also a cousin of Brian Horbert Bonham Carter, who was taken prisoner in 1940 whilst working for Toc H in France. Here's a picture of some of the domestic staff in the 60s or 70s, I should think. Um, Putney remained open until the bitter end, closing in 1983. It's still there, it's been much modified in his private housing. In February 1930, 
the journal announced the purchase of a house in Derby, but it did warn there'd be considerable alterations necessary before it could be opened. Graham House was at 228 Osmiston Road, midway between the town and the engineering works, where many of the marksmen were employed. Tock H took possession in March 1931, and it was opened by the Duke of Devonshire on the 16th of May. It closed in 1969 and has been demolished. There's a care home on the site now. Since the Red House in Leeds never really took off as a mark, in 1929, Lord Brotherton, a former MP who made his fortune in the chemicals industry, offered to find and endow another house for Tock H to act as their divisional HQ. The house he found was at 13 North Grange Road in Headingley, um, originally called Lindhurst. It was changed to Brotherton House when Tock H took it over. Lord Brotherton died in October 1930 before the house was handed over. So his executors passed Tubby the title deeds on the 5th of December 1931 at a Yorkshire area festival. The storming party went in on New Year's Day 1932 and Mark 23 was officially opened by the Princess Royal on the 19th of March. The very first occupant was an Australian in Yorkshire to learn wool dyeing. Um, rooms were dedicated to local regiments and battalions as normal, but one room was dedicated to the dead of the Bentley Pit disaster, which occurred relatively recently on the 20th of November 1931, when a gas explosion caused the mine to collapse, killing 45 people. The chapel received the original cross from Gilbert Talbot's grave, although this later went to All Hallows and then back to Talbot House. Um, it was still a mark in 1968, but it was pending closure with huge losses. And it's now called Bishop's House and it still stands. The last of the true marks, for want of a better expression, was also the most famous building, having been the birthplace of William Gladstone, the four times British Prime Minister. This imposing property at 62 Rodney Street was given to Tock H by Gladstone's son, Henry Neville Gladstone, who also happened to be a cousin of Gilbert Talbot's mother, Lavinia. Gladstone House was officially opened after some refurbishment in December 1931, with both the Mayor and Bishop of Liverpool present. And though it was always run as a mark, it didn't get its number until after the war. There are two memorial rooms of note. One is the Gladstone Room, which is the room where the great man was born in 1809. And the other is the Leonard Coma Wall Room, which also pays tribute to Blackie, his workhorse. Uh, on the 8th of June 1917, a week after he was promoted to Lieutenant, Leonard was with the RFA in action near Wishgate when he was hit by shrapnel from a shell. His groom was killed by the explosion and his mount, Blackie, was badly injured but survived. Leonard was taken to a Castry clearing station, but he died later that day and is buried at Missenhook Cemetery. But Blackie was brought out of the army by Leonard's mother, and after a period of recovery on a farm, he returned to duty at Wellington Barracks in Liverpool, before finally retiring to Horses Rest in Broad Green, where he died peacefully in late 1942. Gladstone House was upgraded in 1974. Um, it was retained by Tockage, but it went self-catering a couple of years later. Uh, it remained until the very end of the 80s when it was finally sold. It's now converted into flats and they still bear the address, flat X, Tock H, 62 Rodney Road. So we've covered the true marks, one through to 24. And I just want to run through one or two additional houses, but not in any great detail. Of these, the most significant of is um, Talbot House at 42 Trinity Square. It's so significant that it's another one that's gonna to have to have a blog of its own sometime next year. But now just a brief history. It was given for the use of Tubby and the Tock H movement in December 1928, the freehold having been purchased by Charlotte Tetley for the newly formed Tetley Trust. It didn't open as a mark, but and the only residents initially were clergy. Tubby himself moved in in 1930. It was often described as a welfare house, offering various services such as a lunch club, catering primarily for city workers. But it also became a focal point for Tock H members from overseas. It was described by David Gibson as a maze of dark, twisted corridors snaking their way between subterranean offices, Victorian studies, and a roof garden, and even a genuine Roman wall. It did eventually become a hostel, but it was never a numbered mark. It closed on the 31st of July 1982 when the Wakefield Trust were planning a major redevelopment. Immediately behind 42, in a row called the Crescent, um, were several properties owned by Wakefield or Tetley Trusts, including number seven, uh, formerly Seamark, 
and that became a hostel for young Bangladeshi lads, which was run by Peter East, who was also the warden of Talbot House from 1967. I'm not going into great detail about the next hostel either, not because I'm short of information, because there's actually plenty. Rather, the work of the League of Women's Helpers is another subject that needs looking at in its own right. Marquis I, as it was playfully but not officially known, was more properly called New June, named for Henry Newbolt's novel. It opened on Tower Hill on Saturday the 4th of October 1924, the ladies decamping from their old HQ at 7 Tower Street. And it was in the top floors of 50 Great Tower Street, uh, which is now covered by the Tower Place Shopping Centre, included a roof garden that was much loved by hostelers. Tabby's sister Belle was one of the residents and she started a lunch club for men from here. In 1927, 2nd June opened at 10 Stanley Gardens, Notting Hill, and this became the headquarters for the League of Women Helpers and a hostel, but this was short-lived and it closed in 1932. Around that time, New June was relocating to a, horse, a house on the corner of Water Lane and Great Tower Street, and Belle Clayton, who died in 1925, had one of the rooms there named after her. Another significant hostel, was the Talbot House Seagoing Boys Club, which was originally based at the Dock House, the picture of top left, on the corner of College Street and Orchard Lane. It later moved to Brunswick Square, but in 1959 an extension was built on that building and the entrance switched to the opposite side in Bernard Street. So the, the pictures on the right hand side at the bottom are, are the front and back of, of that um, version of the, the house. Uh, it closed on the 2nd of April 1982. But if you want to know more about this one, then Ray Fabes wrote a paper, which is available through the Tokate Centenary blog. And there were others. In 1925, Brighton Tokate ran a boys' hostel for newspaper lads and hawkers, situated at 60 and 61 John Street. It was just a few doors down from where they ran a local Rover Scout unit. It was a pub until 1918, and, and the building became known as the John Street Tokate Boys' Hostel but it only lasted until the end of March 1926, when it appeared to be taken over by the St Vincent de Paul organisation. Haleybury House also joined the list as an unnumbered hostel in the summer of 1925. Uh, this was based at Durham Row Stepney and was originally run by Haleybury College. It was most famous as being somewhere that M Clement Attlee, pictured here, um, lived and volunteered when he first started out as a barrister. He was in fact the manager there from 1907 to 1909. Toc H took it over and Stepney Group used it as their branch rooms as well, but it was gone from the lists by July 1927. In January 1926, another hostel was added at 16 Rutland Street Home in Manchester. Yet another old pub theme here. Um, the Bleak House, it closed in 1924. Um, the, the hostel deliberately set out to attract the working class of the home district. Tokates felt that the, the standard houses were just too pleasant and too suburban. So retaining the name Bleak House, it became something of a homeless shelter, working with the down and outs as they were at the time. Um, although former regulars of the pub used to call in for a chat and they found the bar was now a, a comfortable club room and a coffee bar. And it was also popular with cabbies, tram drivers, night workers. Beer was off the menu, but they were always offered a, a cuppa. Uh, it was dedicated on 30th of April by William Temple. In early 1929, a hostel at 20 Road, Bournemouth was transferred from the Gordon Boys Association to Tock H, but they didn't seem to run this one for very long. This building became private, became a council welfare services home and uh, then a care home, which has only just been demolished and rebuilt. So now we're going to look at just um, a few more marksmen, including some who you might loosely bake call celebrities. Uh, Robert Shaw was chairman of his top H group at Truro School, and um, this led him to lodgings in Fitzroy Square in 1946. This was a time when the Mark was involved in a project in the heavily blitzed slums of Whitechapel, and Shaw was only too happy to roll his sleeves up and join in with all the painting and renovation. Shaw, of course, made a fleeting appearance in the Lavender Hill mob, but it was as Captain Dan Tempest in the Buccaneers that he found TV fame, and then as the villain Donald Grant in From Russia with Love that he uh, broke him on the big screen. The peak of his fame was probably playing Grint in Jaws, but his career was cut short in 1978 when he died of a sudden heart attack. He was only 51. 
Chris Spedding, or Peter Robinson, as he was born, is one of the great British session guitarists of the 70s and 80s, though he'll probably be forever remembered for his somewhat novelty hit motorbiking. As a youngster in the early 60s, his dad got him a place at Mark II in Pimlico, but it didn't last all that long. He was asked to leave because he constantly broke the curfew. Yeah, well, being in bed by 10 p.m. isn't very rock and roll. Spedding released his debut solo album, Songs Without Words, in 1970, before going on to work with the Sex Pistols, the Pretenders and Paul McCartney, to name but a few. However, his greatest success went almost unrecognised, as he was a Wellington Womble, complete with flying V guitar on the Womble's string of hits in the 70s. Peter Skellen lived in Mark III in the late 60s, whilst he was studying at the Guildhall School of Music and Drama. After struggling to make it as a classical pianist, he decided to go down a pop route and hit the big time with You're a Lady in 1972. For the next decade or so, he was a popular artiste on TV and variety shows, and he always maintained a steady career with his mixture of comic songs, often in with Richard Stilgo, and light classical and choral music. In 2016, he achieved a lifelong ambition to become a priest and was ordained by the Bishop of Truro. However, he also revealed he had an inoperable brain tumour and he died in February 2017. Born in South America to British parents, Robert de Warren got his early dance training in Uruguay before coming to London to study at the Royal Bally School. He lived at 42 Trinity Square for almost a year in 1952 whilst he was studying at Sadler's Wells and he told me recently that he knew Tubby and was grateful for his guidance. He also made lasting friendships at Tower, on Tower Hill. After completing his training in dancing with the Royal Ballet, he became a choreographer and he was artistic director of the Northern Ballet for 11 years and then the Sarasota Ballet of Florida, where he now lives. Um, Austin Herbert Croom Johnson, known to his fellow marksman at Mark I, where he lived for a year in 1928-29 as Croom or Ginger. Austin was a pianist, composer and radio producer who began working for the BBC in the late 20s. However, he found fame and fortune when he went to the States in the mid thirties as a jingle writer. He was working with Alan Kent in television from around 1947 and the pair are widely credited with being the fathers of the modern short jingle. One of their jingles for Pepsi is often quoted as the most memorable jingle of all time. Croon died in 1964. And that's just about it. We've looked at all the classic marks and a few extras, but it's still only half the story at most. I haven't mentioned the overseas marks. There was Pierhead House at Wapping, Clayton House in Crawley. Well, we could go on forever. And in 1939, as a new world was dawning, there was a new need for Torbett houses. One day I will tell the story of the services clubs and BEF marks that sprang up everywhere during World War II. There's also scope to look at some of the residential centres and other special properties that Tog Age experimented with after the war. But that's all for another time. To close though, um, as we've been through this story, we've heard time and time again how the concept of the marks died off. By the 50s, several had already closed, and by 1983, they would all be gone. You can see the how they were. This was, I think, early 60s, late 50s. Um, one man had much to do with the marks and was director of Tock H at the time. They were finally closed. Is Ken Prudhoe Broom. Now, here Ken writes about their demise. By the 1970s, it was becoming increasingly clear that there were problems. The Marks were no longer offering the kind of accommodation that most young people wanted. Young men were no longer happy to sleep three or four to a room. They no longer wanted an evening meal provided at a set time, but wanted a kitchen where they could cook for themselves and entertain their friends. Hostel living was no longer very attractive. And the buildings were not suitable for conversion into something more appealing. Self-catering was not possible in Mark kitchens, and conversion to single rooms would mean reduced numbers and greatly increased deficits. And the marks were already uneconomic. What the marksmen paid simply didn't cover the running costs. The buildings were mostly old and the maintenance was expensive. And leadership was a significant problem. The idea was that one of the residents was appointed as the honorary warden, but for someone in their spare time to manage the house, mentor the other residents, discover the needs of the neighbourhood and encourage the residents to help meeting them was really too much to ask. But it was the increasing losses incurred by the Marks, even without counting the staff time involved locally and at headquarters, that forced action. 
The first step was to see if the Marx concept could be adapted and made more appropriate for the later 20th century. Some started admitting women. Some reduced the number of residents to make the accommodation more attractive, but that didn't make sense financially. So we started looking at each building individually. Bristol was replaced by a smaller building run as a community centre by Johnny Macmillan. A similar centre was opened in Croydon, run by Bob Mills. Mark I was closed and turned into an international centre. By the early 80s, there were only a few marks left, 7, 13, 20 in Denmark and in London, and I think Manchester and Liverpool. At a residential weekend meeting of the Central Executive at Allison House, there was a lengthy debate on the Saturday evening, at the end of which was agreed that the remaining marks should all be closed and the building sold. In the cold light of Sunday morning, I think we were all a bit shell-shocked by this radical decision, but we stuck with it. The actual closures took some time and there were one or two long time residents who had to be helped to find alternative accommodation and a number of objections had to be listened to and rejected. But that was the end of the marks. They had for many years been a central part of Top H, but they were now outdated and a financial encumbrance. So that was pretty much that. The houses that Love built were boarded up and sold, but they played their part in the Top H story for 60 years and their legacy remains to this day. Well, I hope that this has been informative and perhaps enjoyable. Um, in the next couple of weeks, I hope to make a more detailed written version of this blog available online. But in the meantime, if anyone has any questions, I'd be more than happy to hear them now. So thank you very much indeed. <laughs>